We are back with best-selling author and Real Housewife of Beverly Hills, Taylor Armstrong. And so I'm, I cannot tell you what it means to me to see you here, here smiling. When I'm I first saw you, I said it's so yeah. good to see. 2011 was not a good year for you at all. That actually, the year came to a head. Mm -hmm. You know, um, can, is there any way? Can you capsulize for people who don't know that mm -hmm. part of your life? It was really tough. It was tough. I um, was a victim of domestic violence for almost six years and finally found the courage to file for divorce. Um, wish I would have done it sooner, but I had um, an orbital floor fracture from being punched and had to have reconstructive surgery. I have a titanium implant underneath this eye. And for me, that was the last straw. Unfortunately, I shouldn't have waited that long, but um, I filed for divorce and then had the surgery and a couple months later I found my former husband hanging. You know, in, in your home? You found him yeah. in the house? I had asked him to leave the house so he had moved into another house mm -hmm. and I, I went looking for him because we were supposed to have a meeting um, regarding our divorce mm -hmm. and he wasn't, he didn't show up for the meeting and I just got this really sickening feeling and as the hours went on I finally went looking for him. You know, when you go, I, I don't know where the journey begins, where one ends and where another begins, because you said when you filed for divorce, I almost want to say that was the first step in your healing. Mm -hmm. But it, I don't know, do you look at that, or what would you say was the first step that you took that began to find the closure and the healing you needed? I would agree with that. I think finally being able to say I've had enough and I'm worth more than this. And it was sad that it took so long and mm -hmm. so much, but that was the day I finally did stand up for myself and for my daughter and said, no more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the fact, I understand though that your friends also helped you too, because they, they, were, they, they knew, but the, perhaps they were afraid to say anything to you. Were they, much, uh, were they a support to you during this whole time? Absolutely. My friends and my family, my mom and I are really close, and, and she was an incredible support system for me. And in fact, when I woke up um, in the hospital after having the surgery, it, it, it saddens me so much to say this, but it's so common with victims of abuse and the roller coaster that you live on when you go back and forth all the time, and you constantly just want to put it back together and hope that things are going to change. But when I woke up, I had was on morphine, so I was a little out of it, and um, my mom and my best friend of 20 years were sitting there, and my abuser walked in the door with a dozen roses and in that moment some very sick part of me wanted him to literally crawl in bed with me and, and hold me in that moment and but I when I looked over at my mother and my friend that was the moment that I thought if I can't do it for me I have to do it for all the people in my life that keep supporting me through this well your daughter was how old was she at the time when she was five, five. five yeah. years old yeah. Yeah, was so five. you <clears throat> write a book hiding from reality, mm -hmm. and which you're not doing anymore, you're living your reality. But was that a cathartic process? Was that a difficult process? What was it like when you closed those pages and said, here it's finished? I actually thought it would be more cathartic than it was. I think it's cathartic now, but in the moment, um, it's kind of a funny story, but I was in Vail, Colorado. I had left to get away because the press was insane. There were paparazzi at our house. I couldn't take my daughter anywhere without people hassling us. And, and so I went to Vail, Colorado to finish my book and I would ski in the day and then just work on it at night. And, um, and I was in an Italian restaurant and I was, John at the time was helping me, my husband was helping me with some business affairs and I was editing and he was editing and we had to get it to Simon & Schuster like by... Your computer? Yeah, oh, I was, we had two okay. computers and we're in this Italian restaurant and... and um, you had a deadline too. I had too. a deadline at midnight, New York time, so we were really rushing and it was like literally right before that time and I sent, pushed send, I shut my computer and I just burst into tears, like the kind where you can't catch your breath and your right. face is red and you're just sobbing and I'm in the middle of a restaurant. So I got up and went into the stall and I was just really crying and I couldn't calm myself down and wanted to just kind of hang out in the restroom until I could get it together. And then all of a sudden I heard, can I get a picture with you? <laughs> so, so oh, my heavens, no. <laughs> Follow me to the bathroom. And, I, oh. and for some reason in that moment, I just kind of started to laugh. And I'm such a people pleaser that I said, yeah, just one second. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't she say, can I help you with anything? Yeah, can, I get a, can I get a picture? Oh, my goodness. 
<laughs> people. People. But you know, in that, it was so it was so good that it happened because I yeah, started yeah, yeah. to laugh and it changed the whole dynamic and I was oh. able to get out of the restaurant. <laughs> good for you that you found the humor in that. You found how that could, that release could happen. But that release, you know, after you closed the chapter, you sent the, you pushed the send button, mm -hmm. and that released something inside did, inside of you. Did you have closure at that time, or are you still suffering from the effects of what happened to you? I, I suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, and my doctor, Dr. Sophie, who was on the show with me and is, has been my biggest supporter, um, he said it's going to take a long time, and I still have times when John will come around the corner and I'm in the kitchen and he'll just walk around the corner and I'll and he'll say what why do you do that <laughs> you know I'm home you know yeah. but it's it's post traumatic stress sure well, how did your how does your daughter uh, how has she gone through this cuz you had your journey that you go through but you're also a beacon of light for her but yet you don't want to shine too much light or did, was she aware of everything that was yeah. happening unfortunately children are more perceptive than we we believe yeah. that they are, um, good and bad, but right. um, for, for me, I didn't think that she knew much of what was happening. I thought, because I had a live-in nanny, you know, by the grace of God, I was fortunate enough to have that. Many people who are being abused, their kids are exposed to it all the time. Sure. But my nanny could sense when something was gonna go wrong and she would immediately take Kennedy. Uh -huh. And so I feel so fortunate for that. But um, I, later on, I did realize that she knew a lot more. How, than, how, how did you realize she knew more? Well, when she was, it was soon after the suicide, um, my um, psychiatrist, Dr. Sophie, had suggested that I continue to bring up her father to her in good ways so that she didn't think people just disappear. So to bring up mm. memories and say, do you miss daddy? And do you remember when we did this with daddy? And try mm. to, to, to make her remember. And so we were in the car on the way to school and she's in her little car seat. And, and um, I was saying, do you miss daddy? And she's like, no, N-O. And then I said, well, do you remember when we were in Hawaii? I was trying to bring up some memories for her and she, I said well I miss him sometimes and she said why would you miss a boy that screamed at you all the time wow. oh. what, what did you what did you say to her I couldn't say anything because I was just tears just started streaming down my face so thankfully she was behind me right. and she couldn't see that but in that moment I really realized she definitely knew more than I thought she did well Listen, the, the, the story got better and a lot better for you. Love came along, John came along. How is, first of all, back in 2011, did you ever vis envision this day coming back around for you? Never. I, I didn't believe that I would ever trust anyone. I mean, I make a joke about it now when I speak, but um, my, as my life was unfolding after everything happened, there was so much more because there was so much financial control in my, in my relationship that I didn't know anything about really what was going on with our finances. There were lawsuits. There was all kinds of things. And well, I understand he didn't give you cash either. He knew where you were at all times. He had a wire on you. You weren't allowed to have money. You knew nothing about your finances at nothing. all. Nothing. I had no access to bank accounts. And so, and I, of course, I had free spending because I had an American Express that he didn't sure. care, but that way he could monitor everything I did. He knew if I was at Coffee Bean, he knew, sure. you know, and wanted to know who I was with at all times. So, well, uh, you're remarried. It's different for you this time, and what has brought, I think, some of the healing for you from what I've gathered is that you're helping others, yeah. and you're talking about red flags in relationships. Uh, what What are some of those things that you want other women who may be down that road you travel you travel to know? I think some of the first things are control, severe jealousy, a lot of criticism. You know, the, the further they can, an abuser can drag you down, the easier it is for them to manipulate you and control you. So a lot of your hair doesn't look good, your dress is too short, you laugh too loud, you laugh too much, you don't you don't laugh enough, you know, it's just constant criticism and there's not going to ever be an answer. So I kept changing who I was little by little, sure. thinking that I would be able to avoid the outburst. But the truth of the matter is I just became a shell of myself. And frankly, when I saw myself on the season, on the first season of Real Housewives, I didn't even like me. I was like, I don't even know who that girl is. Like, I just looked like a ghost of the girl that I used to be. You know, Taylor, you just said something beautiful. Uh, t uh, we know that you said to your husband when you agreed to marry him. What, what was that? Because that's important. <laughs> but I talked about change. I said, if you want to marry me, you have to love me exactly the way I am because I changed so much for so long and I'm just finding who I am again and I can't change anymore. And I. I'm a Gemini, so there's eight of me. So you got to pick which. <laughs> you got to love all of us. All of them, yeah. I'm right here with you, Gemini too. Thank Gemini you. too. Thank you. So happy for you. Uh, if you, by the way, uh, think you need help or you you're, you would like to reach out, you can call the following number at the bottom of the screen: 1-800-799 SAFE S A F E, or you can go to thehotline.org for help. Somebody's out there and willing to listen and willing to help. Taylor's book, Hiding from Reality, is in bookstores <laughs> nationwide. Go pick it up.